This is the third in our series, Can We Trust the Bible? I'll take questions at the end, so if you'd like to, you know, you wonder about something I say today or anything about uh, trusting the Bible, uh, ask at the end. For 17 centuries, Christians have believed the Bible is inspired by God and fully reliable in all that it teaches. Then beginning with the Enlightenment, 715 to 1789, over the last uh, three centuries, many people began to adopt naturalism, the belief that there is no God and all there is is what we can see and touch in this world. So there can't be, there can't be miracles. So they looked at the Bible and said the miracles are inauthentic. They were made up by the writers to make Christianity more appealing. So how do we know that the writers didn't just make up what we read about in the Bible. And how about the prophecies? The many prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled by Jesus or fulfilled at other times. How do we know the, those weren't just made up after the fact? People that don't believe in the supernatural say these couldn't be written ahead of time. There's mass ignorance today about the Bible. Never before have more people grown up with no knowledge of the Bible. Never read it. Uh, never gone to church or Sunday school. And so when critics say the Bible's not true, they have nothing with which to refute it. Every December, religious pollster George Barna uh, puts out his top 10 findings of the year. In 2014, he wrote, Bible skepticism is now tied with Bible engagement. For the first time, he writes, since the Barna Group and American Bible Society's Bible engagement tracking began, Bible skepticism is tied with Bible engagement. The number of those who are skeptical toward the Bible, who believe the Bible is just another book of teachings written by men that contain stories and advice, has nearly doubled from 10% to 19% in just three years. This is now equal to the number of people who are Bible engaged, who read the Bible at least four times a week and believe it is the actual inspired Word of God. Maybe you are among the more 19% of Americans who do not believe the Bible is true. In 2019, Barna updated his results. He said 19% of people are still Bible engaged, so that number has stayed the same, but the number of Bible skeptics increased. He found 35% of people in America never opened a Bible last year. Widespread ignorance of the Bible makes it difficult to have confidence in the Bible. So can we believe the Bible is true? Can we be, believe, build our lives on the truths in the scriptures? Teenager, single person, married, parent, grandparent, you need to know why you can believe the Bible is true. I believe we can believe the Bible is true. I want to share with you six reasons we can believe the Bible. One, the claims of the Bible. Historical documents uh, are public documents. You open an historical document and you begin with the assumption that it's true unless it proves itself false. So the Bible is a public document. What does it say about itself? The Apostle Paul writes, all scripture is God-breathed. The claim is that every word in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, and Greek Bible, New Testament, is breathed out by God. It began with God through the human authors. God inspired the writers in such a way that they wrote without error. Second reason we can believe the Bible is true is the documentary evidence. The number of manuscripts we hold of the Bible are unparalleled with other ancient documents. Uh, Plato, we have seven manuscripts. The earliest dated is 900 AD. That means there's a gap between when Plato wrote and what we have of 1,200 years. Yet when we read Plato, I think most of us assume we're reading Plato. It's actually what he wrote. Euripides, we have nine manuscripts. The earliest date is 1100 AD. That means there's a gap of 1500 years between he, what he wrote and what we possess. 
Aristotle, we have 49 documents. Earliest is 1100 AD, that's a gap of 1400 years. Yet we assume when we read Aristotle, we're reading what he actually wrote, right? Josephus, we have nine documents. The earliest is 1000 AD, that's a gap of 900 years. Look at the New Testament. We have 24,000 documents. The earliest is 100 AD, that's a gap of about 30, 40 years from when it was originally written. That's very short compared with other ancient documents. So the ones that are 100 AD are uh, papyrus documents written on papyrus plants. Uh, we, they are uh, f uh, fragments of parts of the New Testament. A gospel, John, one of Paul's writings. Uh, we have uh, 307 uncials. Uncials are written on animal skins like sheep or goats. The most fascinating one is Sinaiticus. It's the entire Greek New Testament dated 350 AD. And then there's Vaticanus, which is almost the entire New Testament, Testament dated 350 AD. So that's only a gap of 300 or maybe 275 years from when it was originally written. That's a very short gap compared with other ancient documents. With the Old Testament, critics began to, to do the same thing they did with the New Testament, saying, you know, there's all these miracles. They can't possibly have really happened, so they had to be made up by the authors. And uh, we find all these uh, things that seem to be historical errors. Well, that whole argument was going along pretty well until 1947, when a Bedouin boy named Muhammad was looking for his goat uh, about eight miles uh, west of the Dead Sea, and he threw a rock in a cave and he heard the sound of pottery. He went in to inspect and he found all these pots filled with biblical manuscripts wrapped in linen and in leather pouches so well preserved that they were kept from 1947 you know, all the way back to 125 B.C. We believe that these were left there by the Essenes in 68 uh, A.D. The most interesting was the discovery of the Isaiah scroll. They found that Isaiah was uh, intact and it was identical with maybe a couple words difference from the Masoretic text which was found, it's dated 916 AD. In other words, what they found in the Dead Sea Scroll was dated 125 BC for a thousand years. Remember, before the printing press, the only way you could pass the manuscripts on is by writing them out line by line. Now you know that when you're copying something, you can make mistakes, right? They found that the Masoretes were so careful in their writing, these scribes, that they found almost no difference between what they found in the Dead Sea Scroll and the 916 AD Masoretic text. Therefore, we can conclude, if the Masoretes were that careful in copying it for a thousand years, we can bet they did the same from 125 B.C. back to 700 B.C. when Isaiah wrote it. In other words, when you hold a Bible in your hand, Hebrew or Greek, or even the English, which is translated, and the, uh, we use the NIV here, and the authors are, were so careful, you can believe that you're virtually reading Almost exactly what was originally inspired by God. Does that make sense? Three, third reason we can believe the Bible is true is the scientific evidence. Archaeology. Archaeology involves the uncovering of art, artifacts, architecture, coins, monuments, documents, and other remains of ancient cultures. If you're trying to ascertain the truthfulness of an ancient writer, you look for accuracy in details such as archaeology reveals. For example, if your friend said to you, last week I drove up from San Francisco to Portland, and at the halfway mark, we stopped at the In-N-Out Burger on Crater Lake Highway in Medford. You could look it up on your phone and find, oh yeah, 
There is an In-N-Out Burger there on Crater Lake Highway, and so it adds credence to his claim that they drove up from San Francisco. In a sense, that's what archaeology accomplishes. The premise is that if an ancient writer's historian's incidental details check out time after time, this increases our confidence in other material that the historian wrote, but can't as easily be cross-checked. For example, you can't cross-check John's claim that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But if you find all of John's historical details by, found by archaeology proved to be true, it increases your confidence that what he wrote about Lazarus is true. In the past 150 years, hundreds of archaeological finds from the first century and Old Testament times have been unearthed. Do these findings confirm or contradict the Bible? Archaeologists have discovered scores of ancient artifacts that have strengthened our confidence in the Bible's credibility. Uh, for example, for years, scholars maintained that Moses couldn't possibly have written the first five books of the Old Testament because the Egyptians didn't have any writing forms. Well then, in 1975... 16,500 tablets were discovered in the ancient city in, of Ebla in modern-day Syria, which established that sophisticated and extensive writing culture existed in the middle of the 3rd century, 3rd uh, millennium B.C., like 2500 B.C., uh, well before Moses' time. Moses was a prince in Egypt, highly educated. He could have used any one of three Egyptian writing systems. Another archaeological div, uh, dig discovered that the walls of Jericho fell outward. Now, if the city had been circled by an army and the army was breaking in, the walls would have fallen inward. But falling outward, you know, kind of substantiates the biblical claim that God caused the walls of Jericho to come tumbling down. Scholars used to cite uh, the reference by uh, Isaiah to Sargon, king of Assyria, as an example of an error because they hadn't found anything in Assyrian writing about a king named Sargon. Notice the assumption. If something's written in the Bible and we can't find any other corroboration of that, then the Bible must be false. Well, then, archaeology discovered the, uh, uh, lots of Assyrian uh, literature that showed that Sargon was king of Assyria. The Bible mentions the Hittites over 40 times. That was declaimed as another error in the Bible because we couldn't find any other literature that talked about the Hittites. Well, then... In 1906, an archaeological dig uncovered the Hittite capital in the modern in modern day Turkey. Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. It talks about the death of the Messiah and how it would occur. That his hands would be pierced and his feet would be pierced. But crucifixion didn't occur until the Romans introduced it. <clears throat> How could it be in the Bible in a psalm written hundreds of years before Christ? So scholars made the conclusion that Psalm 22 must have been written after Christ died. Well, that was going fine until Muhammad discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. And in it, what did they find? Voila, the Psalms dated hundreds of years before Christ's death. And Psalm 22 had to be inspired by God. So you got that, uh, Pat, Psalm 22. Let's just read a, a few verses from that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember Christ shouting that from the cross? This is written hundreds of years before Christ. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults. Remember people shouting insults to Christ as he's carrying the cross? And, and while he's hanging on the cross? Shaking their heads? He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. They said, if he's the son of God, then let God save him. Prove it to us. Then we'll believe. 
I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt. Remember when Christ cries out on the cross, I'm thirsty? And they give him something to drink. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. They pierce my hands and my feet. That's a Roman crucifixion. That's how you attach a person to the cross. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Remember the Roman soldiers casting lots for Jesus' clothes? Well, when they found this in the Dead Sea Scrolls, then they had to conclude that this was a prophecy supernaturally given by God hundreds of years before it was fulfilled. John 5, John records how Jesus healed an invalid by the pool of Bethesda. John provides the detail that it was a, uh, had five, a pool that had five porticos. So for a long time, scholars said, here's an example of an error in John because they couldn't find any evidence that there was a pool with five porticos. Well then, more recently, they did an excavation by the pool of Bethesda, or they found it by the Sheep Gate, which we should be able to see when we travel to Israel next year. It was found 40 feet below ground, and sure enough, there were five porticos, which is like five, you know, covered porches, exactly as John described it. Archaeologists have also unearthed the Pool of Siloam, John 9, Jacob's Well, John 4, the pavement where Pilate tried Jesus, John 19, and Solomon's porch in the temple precincts, John 10. Interesting, all of these are references in John, which remember the Jesus Seminar members, they, they, they coded it all black and said, meaning it's inauthentic, not true, wasn't really true. Archaeology has found all these references in John to be historically accurate. 1961, an inscription discovered in Caesarea provided the first extra-biblical corroboration that Pilate was indeed the governor when Jesus uh, lived. In 1990, the burial grounds of Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, were uncovered in Jerusalem. In Luke 3, chapter 1, you're not getting tired of these references, are you? Okay. Uh, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, <coughs> when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee. So Luke does this all the way through Luke and Acts. He gives all these historical references as to exactly when he was writing. His brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Traconitai, whatever, something. Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, well, critics would say, all right, Lysanias, we know he wasn't tetrarch of Abilene. Uh, he was uh, the uh, leader of Chalcis half a century earlier. If Luke can't get this basic fact right, why, why should we believe anything else Luke tells us? That's when archaeology stepped in. An inscription was found in the time of Tiberius, that's Caesar Tiberius, which names Lysanias as Tetrarch of Abilene, near Damascus, just as Luke had written, proving Luke to be exactly right. Another example is Luke's reference in Acts 17.6 to the Polytarchs. Scholars couldn't find any reference to polytarchs in Roman ancient literature, so he assumed Luke didn't know what he was talking about. So Luke says, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the polytarchs, city officials, polytarchs, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Well, then archaeologists discovered a first century arch that said, in the time of the polytarchs, and since then, archaeologists have found 35 references in Roman ancient uh, uh, literature to polytarchs, and several of them in Thessalonica. Again, proving Luke to be perfectly correct, and the critics wrong. Father of Modern Archaeology, William Albright, writes, There can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of the Old Testament record. 
Miller Burroughs of Yale said, on the whole, and Yale, remember, is one of the most liberal seminaries in the country, archaeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scriptural record. Nelson Gluick said, there's been no archaeological discovery to repudiate a single biblical reference. So nothing archaeology has found has disproved anything in the Bible of being true. One writer said, thanks to archaeology, we now have more information about Old Testament Abraham than we do of Abraham Lincoln. A fourth reason we can believe the Bible is true is because of the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Louis Lapidus grew up as a Jew in Newark, New Jersey. His family never talked about the Messiah. He said it never came up. His parents got divorced when he was 17, stabbing a hole in whatever religious belief he had. He thought, what good? Where's God at a time like this? What good is religion if it doesn't help you when you're in a crisis? He graduated from high school and got drafted and went to Vietnam. At his orientation in Vietnam, the sergeant said, 20% of you will die. The other 80% of you will either get venereal disease or become an alcoholic or a drug addict. He thought to himself, great. I have like a, not even a 1% chance of returning home normal. He survived Vietnam, but it led to a whole period of questioning in his life. He got into alcohol and drugs and Eastern religions. He was walking on the Sunset Strip in L.A. one night when a street evangelist was talking about Jesus. And he gave the stock answer, hey, I'm Jewish. In other words, bug off. Jesus doesn't have anything to do with me. The guy responded, have you read the Messianic prophecies? Well, Lepidus was, was taken aback. He'd never heard of them. And the guy began to quote him Hebrew prophecies. He said, wait a minute. I grew up hearing those. And the guy offered him a Bible and he said, read it and ask the God of Abraham if Jesus is the Messiah. So he began reading the Old Testament. He found four dozen predictions about the Messiah in the Old Testament. He would come from the ancestry of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, be from the tribe of Judah, of the house of David. The Psalms portrayed his per, uh, betrayal, his accusation by false witnesses, his manner of death, being his hands being and feet being pierced, although crucifixion hadn't been invented yet and his resurrection. When he reached Isaiah 53, he was stopped cold. Isaiah 53 gives very specific information about the death of the Messiah. Uh, let's, let's show some of that. Uh, let, uh, let's read that. He was, this is Isaiah, 700 B.C., 700 years before Christ. He was despised and rejected by mankind. Christ was very popular at some times, but ultimately at his crucifixion, he was despised and rejected. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. The crucifixion was very painful. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. His, his appearance was so grotesque after his beating and crucifixion. The people hid their faces from his face. We held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Uh, people saw Jesus on the cross and they were uh, thinking he got what he deserved. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The Bible teaches that the reason Jesus died on the cross was for all of our sins, all the sins of the world. The punishment that brought us peace, in other words, with God, was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. All, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Remember, Pilate was shocked when he says, are you really the son of God? Are you really the Messiah? And Jesus didn't answer a word. 
Pilate couldn't believe it. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Remember Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy uh, Pharisee, came forward and said, I'd like to take Jesus' body and put him in my tomb. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah wrote all of this 700 years before the crucifixion of Christ. The Bible is filled with so many prophecies, so specific, they couldn't have just happened by chance. It was foretold that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, come from the tribe of Judah, be born in Bethlehem, be called out of Egypt. Remember Joseph and Mary took, uh, when Herod was killing all the babies in the Bethlehem area, took him to Egypt. Then he came back, ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Remember Jesus on a donkey on Palm Sunday? Be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Remember that's what Judas sold him for? Die on a cross without any bones getting broken. It's almost impossible to go through a crucifixion without a bone getting broken. But that's what happened with Jesus. And rise again on the third day. Statistician Peter Stoner informs us that the odds that any man might fulfill all eight of these prophecies that Christ fulfilled would be one in 10 to the 17th power. Or one in, look at this, 100,000, 100 million, 100 billion, 100 trillion. At that point, we run out of mathematical numbers, so we just say 100 zillion. To, to, to comprehend this staggering probability, if we took a hundred trillion trillion silver dollars and spread them out all over the state of Texas, it would fill the state two feet high. Mark one of those silver dollars, then blindfold a man and say, okay, you can go anywhere you want. Find the one marked silver dollar. The chances of him finding that would be the same of Jesus fulfilling all eight of these prophecies. Lepidius was so stunned by what he read in the Old Testament that he decided to read the New Testament for the first time in his life. He opened to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. Matthew's initial words leaped off the page. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He said, wait, wait a minute. He's one of us. He's a Jew. One night when he was in the Mojave Desert with some of his friends, he went off by himself and he prayed to God. He said, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I want Jesus in my life. I am so messed up. Would you come in? He became a Christian that night. And Lepidius has gone on to become probably the leading scholar on Old Testament biblical prophecies fulfilled in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The Bible records many other prophecies that were fulfilled in the Old Testament. The prophet Dan I'll just give you two. The prophet Daniel foretells of four kings arising in Persia, the last angering the Greeks. The Greek ruler would then arise and conquer the world, and his empire would be divided into four. Alexander the Great fulfilled all those prophecies. Then in Ezekiel 25, we read the prophecy of Tyre being destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar with other nations participating. It would be laid bare like the top of a rock. Fishermen would spread their nets on the site. The debris from the destruction would be thrown into the sea and the city would never be rebuilt. All these specific prophecies were fulfilled, indicating that the Bible must be divinely inspired. The Quran has only two prophecies and they are general in nature. The Bible has dozens and dozens that are remarkably fulfilled. Demonstrating that the Bible really is a supernatural book inspired 
by God. We can believe the Bible is true. So far, we've looked at four reasons. We'll look at two more next week. The claims of the Bible. The Bible is a public document. It claims to be fully inspired by God. Unless there's evidence that proves that, uh, the Bible false, we have to believe what it claims. The documentary evidence, the number of manuscripts we have about the Bible, particularly the New Testament, are unparalleled with other ancient documents. So if we believe other documents are true, we can certainly believe the Bible is true. The scientific evidence, archaeology, has uncovered things time and again. Uh, Professor Wellhausen, um, I'm not sure how many years ago, he said there were 1,500 errors in the Bible. Or he didn't know if I had 15, they were wrong. Now, thanks to archaeology, we've got that number down to about 50. In other words, 50 that, boy, this doesn't seem right. And remember my position? I don't just call it an error. I say we've got to do more research until we figure it out. And then the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. They are so many, so remarkably fulfilled that we have to conclude it's a supernatural prophecy. So this week I want you to read the Bible with new eyes. Say, God, I see that the Bible really is true. You claim it's from you. So when I'm reading it, I'm having a meeting with you, God. Parents, talk to your children about reasons why they can believe the Bible. Just go over the four things we've looked at today. So when they go off to college, they don't lose their faith. Now next week I want to share with you the most important reason we can believe the Bible is true. The teaching of Jesus. Jesus prophesied that he would be crucified, buried, and three days later he would be raised again. And then he pulled it off, demonstrating that he really was the Son of God. Because Jesus did that, I'm going to go with Jesus' teaching all day long. So next week, we'll look at, next week, we'll look at what Jesus taught about the Bible. Do not miss next week. Maybe you've heard enough today to say, okay, I believe in you, Christ, and I want you in my life. You can do that as we pray in just a minute. Maybe you've heard enough to say, I'm going to commit myself this year to start reading the Bible. Try to read a little bit every day. Maybe use the church journals. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've given us a word that we can count on that tells us about you and about Christ and about the Holy Spirit so we can have a relationship with you. Thank you so much. You pray right now. Thank you, Father, uh, that we can have confidence in the Bible. Help us now to... Do something with that and read it uh, this week. In Jesus' name, amen.